Now, if you look in your program, you'll see that it says that Tim Hughes is preaching today, and that's me. And I think the reason why, the main reason I'm preaching here today is because of something that Rick said in a sermon a couple of weeks ago. I was here with my wife and sitting with my family out here. And if you remember, he was in this series on life, the game life. And the end of that series was retirement. And I'm a retired pastor, so, you know, I was really listening to what he had to say. And now I don't know that he said this exactly, but what I heard was that, that older pastors should help younger pastors. And then he called me up this week and said, hey, I've got COVID. Would you be willing to preach for me? And I said, absolutely. So it was like, man, I, I knew he was talking to me, but I didn't know it would just be like two weeks later and he'd be asking me to help him. I'm not even sure how much older I am than him when it comes right down to it. So what I, what I want to know today is if there are any, any people here that are really good at math or that they would consider themselves to be a math person that they like math they use math they enjoy math and you know they maybe get a's and b's in school in math would anybody be in that category you know don't be shy if you if you really like math okay yeah quite a few quite a few mathematicians here all right the other thing i want to know is is there anybody here that would say, eh, I, I'm just not really a math person. Uh, I do what I need to do, but, you know, it's not my thing, and I can't say I got A's and B's, maybe I got C's and D's, but, or if I got a good grade, I didn't enjoy it. All right, but is, is there anybody here that would say, yeah, I'm not really a math person? All right, okay, that's, that's good to know. And, and yet, at the same time, we all use math a lot. Every single day, even though you think maybe you don't use math, you do. And I was talking to my grandson about this, Liam. And I told him I was preaching on God's math. And he kind of looked at me like, what? And I said, yeah, we all use math. So let's say that you're trying to hit your sister with a water balloon, and she's running, and you're trying to you know, do the right trajectory and lead her, you know, so that you, you know, really hit her good. You're using math. You know, your brain is using math. You may not realize it or not, but you're, you're using math. I think that probably there are certain professions that notice people getting creative with math, maybe more than other professions. So, like, for example, people that work for the IRS, I imagine they see some pretty interesting math on people's tax returns. And maybe when you're looking at the checkbook and, you know, there's somebody else in your family that is trying to balance the checkbook and you look at it and, boy, somebody's getting really creative here with, with uh, their math in, in this checkbook. But I think of all the strange math I've ever seen in any capacity, the strangest math I've ever seen is right in the Bible. The Bible has the most amazing math. It's just different. I mean, it just doesn't really seem to commute, compute. And, you know, here's, here's something that, that I would say right off the bat, that I know that God is a mathematical genius because he created the world, he created the planets, he hung the stars in place. I mean, we know that God has to be the best mathematician that there is. But then you open up the Bible and, man, these formulas just, don't work out. So, you know, just right out the door, let me tell you one that has a lot of people puzzled. And that's, that's the one that we're going to put up here on the board, that 1 plus 1 plus 1 equals 1. Now, how in the world can that be true? But it is true. God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit, that's three persons. But the Bible says over and over that it's three people, three persons, but one God, it's one God. So one plus one plus one equals one God. Now, I know that the Trinity, the, the, the whole doctrine of the Trinity is kind of hard for people to comprehend. And, 
I mean, if, if God was totally simple to understand in every way, then he must not be a very great God. So it's only natural that you're going to have some things that you don't really know or don't really understand about God. So that's not something to be afraid of. But just right, right off the bat, here's, here's one that this just doesn't match up with what we learned in grade school, does it? Okay, now let me give you another example. Jesus said that God pays as much for one hour of work as he does for a whole day's work. I mean, if you try to do that in today's work world, the unions would be after you. A lot of people would be after you because, I mean, it just doesn't seem fair. Economically, we know that kind of thing doesn't work, but that's what we find. And I'll give you the scripture verse, Matthew chapter 20, verses 1 through 16. I'll read it for you. For the kingdom of heaven is like a landowner who went out early in the morning to hire workers for his vineyard. He agreed to pay them a denarius for the day and sent them out into his vineyard. About nine in the morning, he went out and saw others standing in the marketplace doing nothing. He told them, you also go out and work in my vineyard and I will pay you whatever is right. So they went. He went out again about noon and about three in the afternoon and did the same thing. About five in the afternoon, he went out and found still others standing around. He asked them, why have you been standing here all day doing nothing? Because no one has hired us, they answered. He said to them, you also go and work in my vineyard. When evening came, the owner of the vineyard said to his foreman, call the workers and pay them their wages, beginning with the last ones hired and going on to the first. The workers who were hired about five in the afternoon came and each received a denarius. So when those who came who were hired first, they expected to receive more. But each one of them also received a denarius. When they received it, they began to grumble. I mean, can, can you put yourself in that position? They began to grumble against the landowner. These who were hired last worked only one hour, they said, and you have made them equal to us who have borne the burden of the work in the heat of the day. But he answered one of them, I am not being unfair to you, friend. Didn't you agree to work for a denarius? Take your pay and go. I want to give the one who was hired last the same as I gave you. Don't I have the right to do what I want with my own money? Or are you envious because I am generous. Now there's a lot of things that Jesus is saying here and really none of it has to do with math. And I'm not recommending that you take this parable and use it in your business, okay? I'm not recommending that you apply this to your workplace at all. And I think that if you and I had been out there working all day in the vineyard and we noticed that other people came in late and only worked one hour, I think we might have felt a little bit cheated. Even though we did negotiate for this amount of money that we received, it's like, well, these guys, what, what were they doing all day? Did they sleep in until noon? Did they go fishing? What were they doing, playing video games? And here, I've been out here working, so yeah, it's fine that you paid them the same as me, but maybe a little bit of a bonus for me? Or maybe a little bit of a perk? because I work so much more than these other people. I mean, we might have felt the same way. It doesn't seem fair. It isn't fair. That's not the point. The point is that God is generous, and God's grace is free, and he doesn't mind doling it out to people who are willing to come into his fold, to come into his church, to work in his vineyard, to be a part of his kingdom. So you got to remember when you, you read a parable, it's a parable. He didn't give somebody's name, and this isn't an actual account. This is a story to make a point. Not only is God's grace free, but it was free for me, and it's free for you. Now, who would have been in the category back in that time when Jesus told this parable? Who do you think would have, in the context, been the people who worked all day long? Probably the Jewish people. They obeyed the law of Moses. They made the sacrifices. They did everything. They were God's chosen people. They did the things that Moses asked them to do, and it was a rigorous kind of thing. And so they've been faithful to God all along. And then Jesus is preaching and teaching, and people that are horrible sinners, all of a sudden now, they're 
they're coming to faith in God, and it doesn't seem fair that they're going to get the same salvation as we get. So this isn't right, and that's the point that Jesus was making. And really, none of us deserve salvation. None of us can be good enough to earn our way into heaven. Nobody's going to get to heaven and guys say, oh, well, you don't need the blood of Jesus applied to you because you're so good. You made it on your own. You, you deserve to come into heaven. No, every single one of us is a sinner. Every single one of us has been cleansed by the blood of Jesus Christ. And that's the only way we're going to get into heaven is because of the blood of Jesus Christ offered on the cross for us. Another example of the, what you might call the atrocious math in the Bible is when Jesus says, and he says it in one breath. He says that one plus one equals zero. And then he turns right around and he says one minus one equals one. And let me give you the verse. Luke chapter 9, verse 24. He says, for whoever wants to save their life Okay, that would be one plus one is going to lose it. One plus one equals zero. But whoever loses his life for my sake is going to save it. One minus one equals one. And I'll tell you what, if you've ever given your life to Jesus Christ, if you've ever given your time, your talents, your treasures, sacrificed it to God, given it to his glory, worked in his vineyard, you know that the blessings that you get are far greater, are enormous compared to what you gave. It's always better to give than it is to receive. And that's what that principle is. We give up our time, we give up our talents, we give up our treasures, and we get so much more. One minus one really is one. And you know, you might say, well, this doesn't compute, but I really like God's math. Now, in another place, God comes up again with an answer that is very, very different than what you and I would say or what our, our math teacher would have taught us. And this next equation is that one is greater than 99. And again, it's like, what? You know, that, that doesn't make any sense. But here's what Jesus is talking about. This is Luke chapter 15, verses 1 through 7. Now the tax collectors and sinners were all gathering around to hear Jesus. But the Pharisees and the teachers of the law muttered, This man welcomes sinners and eats with them. Then Jesus told them this parable. Suppose one of you has a hundred sheep and loses one of them. Doesn't he leave the ninety-nine in the open country and go after the lost sheep until he finds it? And when he finds it, he joyfully puts it on his shoulders and goes home. Then he calls his friends and neighbors together and says, Rejoice with me, I have found my lost sheep. I tell you that in the same way there will be more rejoicing in heaven over one sinner who repents than over 99 righteous persons who do not need to repent. So heaven throws a bigger party when one person who is far away from God comes to believe in Jesus Christ than thinking about the 99 that are safe and secure in the fold, in the flock. Because we don't have to worry about them. They're in the fold. They're in the flock. But that one person, that one lost sheep is still out there. And we want to find them and we want to help them to come to faith in Jesus Christ. And I would imagine that almost every single person in this room has somebody that they would consider to be that one that doesn't believe in Jesus and is far, far away from God. And just, just think about how you would rejoice if that person did come to faith in Jesus. It would, it would make you so happy to know that finally they are snatched from the jaws of hell and they are going to be in heaven with you forever and ever. Now, I'm not a businessman. I've never been a businessman. But I think with people that have a business, they have a plan. And in that plan, they allow for a certain percentage of loss. Because they know that whatever goods it is that they have to, to sell, 
Some of it is going to get damaged in shipping, and some of it is going to get shoplifted, and some of it is going to be damaged by their employees. You know, whoops, I dropped that. You know, well, they count on that. They know that's going to happen. They write that off. That's, that's just the expendable part. They, they allow for that kind of thing in their business plan. But there's no expendable people in God's plan. There's nobody that God says, oh, well, that's, that's okay. We don't care about them that much. We've got the 99. That's good. Well, just forget about it. I'm not going to waste my time going after that lost person out there because I've got the 99 here, and that's what matters. That's never the equation with God. God always cares about that person that is out there lost, that is far, far away from him, and he never writes anybody off. God puts a high value on every single person, man, woman, and child. And the Bible actually says that God is not willing that any, that any should perish, but all should come to salvation in Jesus Christ. Now, there's a story that is told about Dwight L. Moody. Dwight L. Moody was, uh, he started a mission in Chicago. He was a man that was uh, really after God's own heart. And one day, he wasn't there at the mission. And his staff, the people that worked with him all the time, you know, they were wondering, where, where, where is he at? And so they're looking all over for him. They can't find him, and they ask around, and nobody knows. And then finally, they find out. Somebody says that, well, I, I saw him. He was, he was in a really bad neighborhood, and he was going into this apartment building. It's very sketchy. And so, you know, his staff is thinking, okay, we've well, got to go find him. And so they... They go down to that sketchy neighborhood, and they go into that apartment building, and there was a lady in there who was so sick, the doctor had said, you've got to go to bed, and you've got to stay in bed because you're so sick. So she's bedridden. And he's in her, her little apartment, only one chair in the whole apartment. He's sitting in it. He's got her baby sitting on his knee. He's reading the Bible to her. And his staff is like, what are you doing you know, you're the most valuable person in our mission. You're, you're the guy that runs the whole thing. You, your time is valuable. This is not the best use of your time. You shouldn't be doing this. Anybody in our mission could be doing this. Free you up for the important things. And he said, yes, I know. I know that anybody in our mission could do this. But none of them do. That was a guy who understood that God loves people. God loves every single person. And, you know, when we look at uh, people that are kind of unlovable or a little bit scary, uh, maybe a little bit undesirable, that's a person that God loves. God cares about that person. That's the lost sheep that God wants to bring into the fold. And you and I have been commissioned to be a part of bringing that person into that fold. God doesn't see anybody as insignificant. Now, that might be bad math. That might be not the best use of your time to, to do that thing for that person that others would say, well, that's, that's insignificant. But I wouldn't have it any other way. And I don't think God would have it any other way now, on another occasion, Jesus performed a, <laughs> a mathematical feat that it just doesn't compute. It, there's just no way that this makes any sense. And so let's take a look at this. Five plus two equals infinity. No, it doesn't. It equals seven. Five plus two <laughs> equals seven. But uh, not, not when Jesus is involved. So this is John chapter 6, verses 1 through 13. This is the time when Jesus fed thousands with a little boy's lunch of five loaves and two fish. Now, those of you that raise your hand when, you, when I asked, okay, is there somebody here that likes math and is pretty good at math? Those of you who raised your hand. Maybe you would have been able to calculate this, how to feed 5,000 people with five loaves and two fishes. Now, if you've been there at the time, and you know what Jesus said, the disciples came to him and said, All these people are here and they're hungry. What are we going to do? And Jesus, this is what Jesus said. He said, you feed them. You do it. You feed them. And they're like, 
Well, all we have is this little lunch. This boy has five loaves and two fish. What are we going to do? So like if you math people have been there, you might have whipped out your smartphone, and maybe you have an app for feeding the multitude. And you'd be able to figure out that, okay, 5,000 men, but also women and children. But just let's, let's just go with 5,000. 5,000 people getting a little fragment of bread. That would be a 0 .001 fragment of bread and the fishes divide that by 5,000 that would equal four ten thousandth of a fish now in order for everybody to have their fill and be satisfied and 12 baskets left over afterwards all right something else has to be going on here something else has to be added in and it was the blessing of Christ and the fact that he was God in the flesh. Now, some people try to explain away this miracle. So they'll say, well, uh, you know, there, there really wasn't a miracle of the multiplication of fish and loaves here. What happened was that, that Jesus fed people communion style. So like everybody got a little tiny piece of bread and everybody got a little tiny piece of fish, but they were spiritually satisfied. It's not what the text says. Or other people try to explain it away by saying, well, this is actually a miracle of sharing. Whereas everybody had a lunch, but they were hiding it, keeping it for themselves. But when this little boy came out, he was willing to share his lunch. Everybody else felt convicted, and so they brought out their lunch, and then everybody shared, and then everybody had enough to eat. So it was a miracle of sharing. That's not what the text says. I will go with what the text says, even though the math, I mean, it just doesn't add up, does it? It doesn't add up. And when I see things like, I did just a few minutes ago when how many little kids got up and walked through that door just for a congregation this size and that many little kids that's incredible that's amazing the families that God has brought to this church and the children that God has brought to this church and I'm telling you sometimes not my grandkids, but sometimes some kids can be a little trying, can't they? Uh, it's funny how, you know, the misbehavior of your own kids or grandkids sometimes is funny, but the misbehavior of other people's kids is not so funny. But I think about those little kids singing songs and hearing the Bible and getting the teaching about Jesus while we're in here with our sermon and our worship. Sometimes people that work with kids or people that work with the elderly or people that work in some capacity or another in a church, they underestimate how powerful their thing is that they do. And it may not be a lot in their opinion. They might even feel like, well, it doesn't really matter if I even show up because what I do is just so small, so insignificant. But when you partner with God, like the little boy with the, the lunch, when you partner with God, what he's able to do with your time and your treasures and your talents, it's enormous. And so we should never underestimate what God is able to do. When God says, you go do it, and then we do it, even though we don't necessarily feel like what we do is that great, but I have this motto, you know, do it poorly until you learn how to do it better. And that's kind of the way it is in the church sometimes. You, you, you go ahead and you tackle the thing and you grow and you become better at it. And God makes, makes up the difference. So mathematically, it doesn't seem possible that all these things could be true, but I, I love, I just love the math of God. Now, I know I haven't probably tarnished God's reputation in this sermon where I've 
kind of presented this idea that God's math doesn't really match up with ours. And I, I know I probably haven't diminished your view of God at all because his math is different than ours. But just in case, I might have given you the impression that his math never is the same as our math. I want to give you another couple of examples. Caiaphas, the high priest, was an accidental mathematician. So the Jewish leaders started getting worried about Jesus because he was attracting a lot of people, the crowds were coming in, and some of the people in the crowd didn't understand that he was talking about a, a kingdom that was not of this world. As far as they thought, this is the Messiah. He is going to lead us against Rome. We're going to kill the Romans. We're going to be independent. And the Jewish leaders are, are thinking, wow, Rome does not take a very high view of crowds of people getting excited about a Messiah. They're going to come in, and they're going to squash us, and they're going to squash the people. And we better do something about Jesus before we get killed or our place is taken away. And so Caiaphas makes this statement that is an amazing true statement. He didn't even realize the, the truth of, of what he said. He said, it is better for one man to die for the sake of many than for many to die for the sake of one man. And he didn't realize it, but the Bible says that he was prophesying when he said that. Now that arithmetic is pretty grim because he's talking about, we've got to figure out a way to kill Jesus. But it was absolutely sound. Jesus did die for the sake of many. He died for you. He died for me. He even died for Caiaphas. That's what happened. There was also that moment when Jesus was standing before Pilate. And Pilate could see that Jesus was innocent, that, that Jesus didn't deserve death. And so he had to figure out a way to, to let Jesus go. And so there was a holiday. And, and at this holiday, generally, he would release a prisoner to the people of the people's choice. And so he gave the people two choices. He, he gave them the choice of Jesus, let Jesus go, or let Barabbas go. Now, let me tell you about Barabbas. Barabbas was a burglar. But he was the kind of guy that would break into your house, steal everything you had, and kill you too. That's the kind of person he was. And so Pilate, I'm, I'm thinking Pilate is, is calculating here, and he's saying, there is no way they're going to ask for Barabbas to go free. They're going to say, okay, we don't want Barabbas because he might come and kill us, so let's let Jesus go. That's what he, I think he was counting on. But as you know, the crowd called for Barabbas to be freed and for Jesus to be crucified. And you know what? If Jesus had been given that same choice, Jesus, you can go free or Barabbas can go free, he would have done the same thing. He would have let Barabbas go free because it, it was expedient for one man to die for many. And that's what he did. He died for those many, and he died for you and me. Now, we speak about the strange math of God, and it's true that it doesn't always add up exactly the way we're taught in grade school. But we love it. I mean, it is spectacular, this math of God. So maybe it isn't bad math at all. Maybe it's higher math and I wouldn't trade it for anything